Shooters Connection offers products for competition shooters by competition shooters. With over 80 years of combined competition shooting experience, Shooters Connection is staffed by master and grandmaster shooters who live the shooting sports every day. Every day. We offer same-day shipping. Shooters Connection also sponsors over 100 of your matches every single year. So when it comes to finding everything you need to compete as a beginner or a seasoned grandmaster, Shooters Connection is the only name you need to know. Online at ShootersConnectionStore.com. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Hit Factor. I am your host, Jeff Cawthon. Jeremy Reed is missing this evening on vacation, I think. I hope, because he's not here. Um, joining me this evening, we have our uh, our local potato, and we also have Sean. Sean Scout, Scouting, right? Yep, Scouting. You that's know how, it. That's how you say it? All right. You got it. Cool. So we're going to be, uh, if, you, if you've been listening, both these guys were on a couple weeks ago, but four nationals, and we talked about the Bill Drill Challenge, and we talked about... Uh, Nationals predictions. So we're going to be going back over those things today. We're going to be talking about uh, how the build drill challenge went. We're going to be talking about the outcome of Nationals and the battle that that was and how we were all watching that. And then obviously these two guys were there. Uh, Potato pays great attention to these things. And I was actually paying more attention than I normally do because this was such an interesting field. Mm. Uh, to pay attention to. So we're going to get into it. Um, so, well, let's talk about, since we were already into it, let's go ahead and talk about the Bill Trail Challenge. Wow. We were, okay. Yeah, Just... we, we were already into it, so our minds are on it. We'll go over that, and then we'll get into uh, going over the predictions. So, so. Jump. Well, they say in news, never bury the lead, and you definitely did not bury the lead. I mean, I could not be more excited about how the Bill Drill Challenge was received. Admittedly, uh, a couple of things held us back with regard to participation early in the event. And I'm talking about the qualifying event, if you will, uh, run by Leif and Hennig. And... Uh, essentially, we had a the first issue related to the participation level of it, I think, was the weather. It was drizzly and 60 degrees and just people don't want to be doing anything that they don't have to outside in that weather. And you've committed to be at a Nationals at a new range that had already had to endure heavy rain. Uh, standing water on a number of stages. So many people on that particular day on Friday had had been forced to shoot either in falling rain or on stages that had like ankle deep water in it. There was one that we filmed on in one instance that reminded me very much of uh, nationals at USSA in Tulsa back in uh, in the teens. And yeah, you know, it was it was one of those deals where it was like plan where you're going to drop your mag. Otherwise, you're going to be fishing for your mag in three inches of water. But it made for beautiful slow-mo action in that instance. I'm off topic right now, but back to the bill drill. Um, the first person who decided to participate in the qualifier was Billy Barton. And it was mid-morning. About a little after 10 o'clock, gray skies, drizzly rain, and thankfully Isaac was hanging around because I admittedly and embarrassed to say I had prior to that moment, I had no idea who Billy Barton was. This is a dude with a really aggressive beard, and um, turns out he's wearing a shirt from Howitzer that has his training company on it because he's also part of the Howitzer Pro Staff. Well, okay. And furthermore, it turns out he's the guy that pushed Isaac in 2022 in the Bill Drill Challenge and is every bit capable of shooting sub 1.5 on demand. And he, I mean, I'm telling you, I posted this on the Shooting USA Instagram. This guy walks out to the line in 68 degree weather with drizzly rain, standing under a pop up tent, pulls his gun out, load, make ready. Shooter ready, standby, beat, bam, 144, clean, first run, cold, off the rip. Like, and I'm, thankfully, 
I was able to muster up my guys to an extent that we got a we got a timer shot. I got a shot over his shoulder. I got a shot on my iPhone for the socials, and my primary photographer got the side shot. And then the reaction interview. He went on from there. It turned out he had bought a hundred dollars worth of attempts. So he brought he had bought you know five banks of two attempts. He shoots a couple that are a little faster, and then he shoots a one thirty one that's clean with a trigger freeze. And he says that had a trigger freeze in it. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, you can stop. You can, you can <laughs> hold on to the rest of your attempts. You buy, you don't have to burn those down. Now he goes on from there to shoot a 123, a 1.23 for the qualifier. He did them all right the there at the beginning in the qualifier, 123. And he's he the did first all those time. runs. Right there. He, he did all 10 of his runs at once. Yes, he did them all right okay. then and then. And like literally was like, I'm just going to do it right now just to see. I just want to go ahead and get this out of the way. And yeah. he could have stopped at a 144. He could have stopped with his 131 with the trigger freeze. Um, but the 123 is insurmountable. Like I, yeah. I to, to this point, have not seen a clean bill drill at that rate. Right. I've seen yeah. iPhone footage of last year's win from Isaac, which was a 126. I've seen some others, you know, here mm -hmm. and there, but in person and on video, 123 is the fastest I've ever seen. So yeah. here comes the questions, right? Do we go ahead and put this out there? And this is Leif to me. Should I update practice score? When should I update practice score? Is this going to kill participation? Yeah. And the honest to God answer to that is, you got to put it out there because if yeah. we don't, we look suspect. Everybody is going to know that this happened. Like this is not going to be a secret. This is going to make its way around. And yeah. anybody who was involved or thought about being involved or whatever, they're going to know about it. And if they can't find it because we didn't put it out there, now we look suspect. So, yes, absolutely. You got to put it out there. But that's really not the point of the qualifier. The qualifier had so many other things going for so many other people in the form of classification payouts in the form of random draw raffle tickets. Like every time you bought an attempt or a pair of attempts, you got another raffle ticket that went into a bucket with your classification. What do you say? Is that not true? Is that not the case? Um, that went into a bucket with your classification. If you had a clean run, Oh, is that right? I was under the impression so that it was once everyone. The, once the prize distribution happened, there was uh, Maylee running a very, very tight ship at Henning Group's table. And she had a list of everybody with a clean run. Uh, okay. And they were eligible for the raffle draw. Ask I understand. How I so I had to say, well, <laughs> on a borrowed gun. Go ahead. Oh, I, the best I had was 178 with a high Charlie on the third shot, uh, using a, a man with a 28 size waist belt and gun, a gun I had never fired. I tried to find where I could put the holster, and that put his first pouch right of my belly button. <laughs> Why didn't you borrow someone? I do not have a 28 bigger. waist. Someone that was bigger. I should have picked someone a little thicker. <laughs> yeah. With a heavier gun. And didn't you not have your own equipment? Because I wasn't present when you shot. Yeah, I didn't have my gear. My gear I'd put in the car. I was done shooting for the day. I just, I just, honestly, I wanted to put $20. I already knew what Billy's run was. I knew on my best day, I'm, I've never been within three-tenths of a second of that. That wasn't going to be the, you know, and unfortunately, I had to register as a GM, so I wasn't going to get okay. any class prizes. Um, well, I just wanted to put my $20 in a hat and, and participate. I'm proud of you noise. for doing it. A lot of people came through and did it. Um, like I yeah. leveraged my friends on the super squad to come and do it. And they did, uh, which was notable. Said in his, yeah. He said in his interview with you, I'll go out there and I'll do my 160, but that's not what I'm really about. And he came out there and he did his 164. 100%. <laughs> he called his shot and it was clean. It was a scoring run. And until Brennan showed up, um, well, Brennan went in as an M. So, you know, Max was Max was second in GM with his one six. Um, and, uh, JBL was third, I believe. Right. The interesting piece about the Brennan operation, his situation was as this thing boiled down to the end of business on Saturday, 
Um, he was sitting with a 134, which I had said, hey, if anybody's within a tenth, you have a legitimate argument to shoot again if you want to buy back in one last time before we declare the winner. And we were all standing around and there was a bunch of hullabaloo and I'm yelling over that PA system trying to get people 50 yards away from where we were unfortunately standing to quit getting in their car and leaving. And I'm trying to muster up as much of a crowd as I can, but that dude was there and he was hesitant to try again. And I was like, I'll tell you what, I'll give you the 20 bucks if you try again, just because I brought an extra 20 for JJ. I told him in the interview, I would pay him 20 bucks to try. And JJ's a big boy, he brought his own money. So I had 20 in my pocket. I was like, here you go. 20, you know, the money is not the issue. Go ahead and give it one more whack. And he did. He went out there and shot a couple of one fours. Unfortunately, that wasn't it. But that dude has the potential to go away from this thing and practice and be ready in a few months. And I think there are a handful of others who now know if you get really spicy and you practice this thing up, you have the potential of getting hot at the right moment. And Maybe the other guy isn't hot at the right moment and it could be a thing. So we're uh, my goal in this is to continue to push this forward, to make names out of people that maybe nobody's really ever heard of. Like, I mean, I never I never knew Billy Barton before the other day and now I do. And yeah. uh, turns out Billy Barton's got a bunch of how to cut your splits training videos on YouTube and. He made a post uh, in his story on Instagram about, hey, welcome to all the new people. And if you want to know how I did it, go take a look at these two videos. I'm like, you're the man, dude. That's exactly what I want you to do right now. But I also like the idea of another guy coming out of the woodwork wearing just a regular T-shirt. You know, he's not a factory shooter. He's not a sponsored guy. He's just a guy. But he's got a 1-4 or even a 1-3. And... You know, how much does it take to get him into a one, two? I don't know. Um, but that's not for me to know. What it is for me to do is continue to put these opportunities in front of people and make this thing entertaining. The um, the agreement, at least as it stands now, is let me finish this project. Let me create what it's going to actually look like as a finished project. Put it back in front of the companies who were involved to begin the conversation of first right of refusal of, do you want to be involved for the next one? Uh, I believe this is going to be so stinking cool that if they don't jump on it, there'll be a line around the block of companies that want involved in this. And my goal is to put the money into five figures. Um, you know, 3000 was awesome for the first yeah. go round. I want it to be 10 K for the next go round. And I'm telling you this Just because so go ahead. What are you going to say? No, man, I'm, in, I'm interrupting. That's, okay, I'm telling that's you this Jeremy because Trump. I'm just finishing uh, working through a project that I shot not this past weekend. Obviously, I was at CO Nats. The weekend prior, I was in Utah for the Rocky Mountain Air Gun Challenge put on by Utah Air Guns. And in the fifth year that they've done that match, the third year that I've been there to cover it for Shooting USA, this year, his cash payout, was a hundred thousand dollars what 20 grand for the traditional bench rest 100 yard match 20 grand for the prs style positional match another 60 grand spread out over pro and what they call sportsman divisions of speed challenge and the other versions of that event but essentially mm. $100,000 in cash paid out to competitors. There is no reason that we can't get to that and more in this format and in others related to this, because I believe this is consumable for not only shooting enthusiasts, people who really know what it takes to rip a one, three or a one, two, but also for people who don't know what it takes. I mean, think back to when Jerry Mitchell shot his record out of the holster I was there, I had a heat stroke because I was running POV cameras and it was Mississippi and it was 118 degrees and I sat on a production case for three hours. And then when I tried to stand up, I was overheated. That's a completely <laughs> different story. But I'm telling you, if that video project, what we did then 
can make it onto History Channel and can become all sorts of the things that it's became over these years, yeah. that element, that visual piece translates to people. And in this case, I think it's better because he did it with a revolver. No disrespect to Jerry and his record. But for me, there is a visual appeal to five or six pieces of brass rainbowing out of a gun and in the air while the, the run is still happening. Like I literally have yeah. slow-mo video wide that shows five pieces of brass spinning out of Isaac's gun as he's trying to make these attempts. I'm so stinking excited about this. Um, it's one of those things right now that has tremendous momentum in social media. Colt picked it up today, the congratulations to Billy Barton picture and put it in front of their half a million followers. Um, for whatever reason though, and I, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to speculate on this. Um, but Brian Connolly pointed it out while we were doing it. The only USPSA people that were present while we were doing that were the ROs that were assigned to the event. Um, and <laughs> I walked away from that going, well, that could be a bad thing. But then at the same time, the explanation I believe is, is that they had scheduled their board meeting for that same block of time. So everyone had to leave to go to the board meeting. Um, but Thanks. promotion after the fact is essentially non-existent. Not that I'm looking well, for I, it. I went to your thing instead of the members meeting. So I still don't know where my nationals are next year. Yeah. <laughs> And also, as you got to you know. give, you gotta give a little bit more respect to, to not you personally, but th the world to Brennan. So uh, Brennan is uh, friends with Billy and they host a podcast together and they've been talking about this stuff for a couple of years. It's called that's uh, awesome. believe, speed up, speed up and get your hits. So there's no mm -hmm. accident that that's the person who is racing, trying to, to catch that 123. Oh, I love it. I, I think it's fantastic. That. And to that point, uh, when we were getting ready to call it done, Billy was standing around and waiting for me to declare him as the winner. And I said, well, who's this, who's this guy? Who's Brennan? And he goes, oh, that's my buddy. He's right here. And I ran over there with the microphone and was like, hey, man, you going to try again? Let's try again. <laughs> and we started that whole back and forth, which eventually he did at my coercion and uh, yeah. at my expense. But Regardless, and, and, and that, we could see the 140 showing up on the screen from uh, 60 yards back, back uh, yeah. under the awning. So that was kind of cool. Well, yeah. shout out AMG Labs for making that happen and getting us the LED screen so folks could see it. If I'd have had it my way, and obviously, you know, that location has its limitations. Nobody had been there before. We'd have done it right there in front of the awning and everybody had been super comfortable. The problem is they had the concrete sidewalks built in and, you know, rightfully so they didn't want the potential for shots to hit their concrete sidewalks so that's yeah. why it ended up you know another 30 or 40 yards away from where everybody was parked and where everybody was getting in their cars to leave so that's yeah. how that all played out it was uh as far as i'm concerned for a first time the negatives that i take away from it and potato we talked about this at the moment Three targets should have been six, so we didn't have to stop and repair targets. And I need a better marker to write whoever's name on the big check, because when I came time to write the name <laughs> on the big check, it looked like a four-year-old had scribbled it on there because I was so frazzled and freaked out. But regardless, uh, if those are the two most negative things that happened in a gun racing event. I feel like it was a success. Right. Yeah. No, that's great. I, I think I was the highest risk of ND, and I didn't. So there you go. Once you got, well, I used to a double way. action pull, and I got one of those short little striker fire triggers. I was worried they were going to. Yeah, there were a couple of guys. A couple of guys shot it from appendix. Um, I got to think of the one guy's name. The second guy who showed Buzz up, Waller. I was not. Yes, that dude's wild now. That dude, that dude is full of energy. I, I like that guy's energy, man. He's talking about we should do the next one from concealment. So, you know, <laughs> there's an argument to be made for that. And, uh, you know, we'll see. We'll see. Hmm. So tell us about the the next stage, the, the final event, how that went. Yeah, so, you know, once, once, uh, once 
once Brennan had had his chance and uh, now we've realized that Billy's going to be the man, um, it's a coin flip to determine who has the honors. And uh, Isaac as the ringer, the defending champion, whatever you want to call it. I like the term ringer um, primarily because the, the director of creative programming at Outdoor Sportsman's Group likes the name ringer. And, sure. and you know, you mean if we're going to make this thing a six figure event, I'm going to need to tap into some of that OSG money. But regardless, <laughs> the ringer had the coin flip and he lost it. And Cold so that get, and it landed tails. That's right. And it was the 30 year coin. That's right. right. It was the, the details here. It, well, I, 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 gotta, the hey, I gotta leave some things for the people when they want to see this, but you <laughs> will be able to see this. And what'll be fun about this is when you see it, you can refer back to this podcast and hear all about the behind the scenes pieces of what ultimately becomes what you get to see. So you're right. It was a 30 year shooting USA coin. Uh, shooting USA logo was called heads. 30 year was called tails. It landed tails. Isaac had called heads in the air. That was a certified landing in the grass. Nobody tried to catch it. None of that foolishness. So that gave Billy the honors. And interestingly enough, strategy piece came into play. Uh, even though he said he would likely start shooting if he won the flip, Billy gave it to Isaac to start. And mm. Isaac opened Even. with a one. Yeah. And so he Isaac said, opened first. <laughs> he did. He 100% did. Well, didn't um, Isaac, in that interview that you did with Isaac on YouTube, he said he was going to go first, I believe. That's right. And behind the scenes and on camera, Billy said that he would do the same. And Billy mm. didn't do that. And that's so, fine. You have the right. You games. have the right to play that game. It's yeah. your game to play. It's he has the honors. Decide what you want to do. So uh, shout out again to HDTargets.com. The guy out of Illinois made me the reactive target centers, the A zone, stick on A zones that we talked about on the show. A yeah. listener of the show connected me to a guy who has a company that makes exactly what I was asking for except he had to custom make these ones because he doesn't have them in this particular size and configuration. Um, okay, cool. That dude literally bent over backwards. He spent like 300 and something dollars overnighting those packages to the hotel in, wow. in, wow. in just so that I would have them. Um, yeah. They were extremely fragile. So we'd be very careful about how we placed them, how we placed the targets, but that made it visually and immediately apparent, like literally from where I was standing, another five yards behind the firing line and then seven yards to the target, I could see the edge hit was in, you know, the ROs went up and carefully inspected it and called it good. But Isaac's first attempt was a clean one. And it was like a one, five, something that put us into one, a six, position. Nine. Was one, it? Six, nine. Hunter, anyway, it was a one, right. six, nine. You're right. I mean, it'll be on TV. It's people. hundred percent. I will be so engrossed in this next week. You'll have no, I mean, it'll be ridiculous, but you're right. It was somewhere in that it was, not super competitive, but it was what he said he would do. He would put up a time and then he would hand it back to hand it back to Billy, which he did. And uh, Billy just started ripping runs, dude. Like it didn't. I think his first attempt immediately trounced that one six and was clean. Um, he had a couple after that that were out. Um, and then ultimately he landed on. Uh, it was not his final attempt. It was the one prior to his final attempt. So it would have been his fifth attempt. He landed on a, the 127, but he had one in the upper scoring area, which is an interesting element in this yeah. discussion because it was the same sort of an orientation that Isaac won with in 2022, meaning, you know, Five in the Billy five made in the, fun of him extensively about that on social well, media. And he last should, year. rightfully so, <laughs> because admittedly he didn't call it. Like he didn't call. Well, that. and it was his draw. He was off the draw, and you'll get that on your cameras. So it's but uh, that he 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 goosed he goosed the draw up over the A zone, put one in the miscatcher, locked it down with his eyes, drove the next five into the lower A, and that was the one twenty seven on his yeah, like you said fifth round. His fourth round was a one twenty nine with five in the target, and right. I think his very first shot actually went over the target. I think it was the same draw. And I, did I, you, I didn't look, but did you see, did you see his first shot? Cause I was under the impression. I yeah. did not realize that was his first shot, but then again, That's I'm sort shot. of watching and I'm sort of, 
hyperventilating and yeah, I'm you're sort filming, of you're, of, you're, you're doing the thing. I'm just watching with my nerdy RO brain. <laughs> that is insane, dude. So on the, like from the rip, the first shot was in that upper scoring area. But anyway, when you really, really going for it on time, you start goosing the draw and right. you get that muzzle up higher than your point of aim. And I, yeah. and again, I don't remember the time because we didn't cycle through for that particular run on some of the runs you did on the AMG, but I would guess right. it's a high fifties or, or a low sixties draw. Well, the beauty of it is, is I have a camera dedicated to the screen. So I have all of those splits. Uh, even though those splits didn't get loaded into the iPad, we had to decide either display on the large format screen or load to the iPad. And at that point I was like, put it on the screen cause it's going into my post-production anyway. Yeah. Um, but that was it. And that gave the ball back to Isaac and I could tell he was under the pressure. Um, well, Billy's and, and final... Billy actually had, had one more run and he wants right. to do it and he's an honest champ, right? Or an honest ringer now because he, uh, he got on the trigger a little early and had a malfunction gun didn't uh, fully cycle. Yep. And you're like, well, you can have a mulligan. And he said, no, it's a Charlie. It wouldn't have been a clean right. run. He said that I'm was done. out. He said that was out. That would have been a bad run anyway, even if the gun ran and I'll give it to him. Um, I don't, I don't want to call that strategy. I want to call that sportsmanship because that's what I mean. I, it's like, he's, a, he's the honest. 100%. I don't think that's 100%. strategy at all. I think he was like, Nope, that wouldn't have been a clean run. So if my gun yep. had worked, I, I wouldn't have had six in the A. Yep, I agree. And so that put mm -hmm. Isaac on the line, and um, he was feeling the pressure, man. It was, uh, yeah. you know, what, what he said to me was, you know, and he kept having trigger freeze. And what he said to me was I was over gripping, and as soon as I tried to, re like, relax the grip, I wanted to relax the grip. As soon as I relaxed the grip, the, the, the spread is everywhere. So... Um, yeah, you got a new champ. You got a new, you got a new ringer. You got the new guy who gets to be the guy at the next one. And, um, I wish that I could come on here tonight and announce we are for sure doing the next one, but I do not, I cannot imagine a world where we don't do the next one. And mm -hmm. I'm talking at the next national. Right. Yep. So you're not for sure doing it at Ironsight Nationals. My my intention is that it will happen at Ironsight, and my intention is that it'll happen again at Open and PCC. Gotcha. I would love to announce officially that that is happening, um, but until I can say for sure, I don't want to put it out there that I said for sure. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I got an well, email from Billy on Monday that I want to just, I want to read something that he wrote to me because I think it's important. Um, and I got to find it and that's kind of goofy. Here it is. Uh, thanks again for all your work at nationals and especially putting together the build drill comp. It was incredibly fun and I'm very excited about the exposure for the sport. Growing USPSA is something I'm very passionate about. And I think this is a great way, not only for the shooting sports, but for the country and our two A rights. That's it. There you go. That's pretty freaking cool. Um, every single person that hung around and watched, every single person that hung around and watched took the time to say, hey, man, thank you for doing this. And that means so incredibly much because, yeah, it was it was a lot going. There was a lot going into it leading up to it. It was not insurmountable, but more than anything, I put a tremendous amount of pressure on myself and my crew when it yeah. comes down to it because – these are the types of things that you get one shot. Like you get one chance to make this look good. And yeah, I get it. We're doing it on a shoestring budget and we're, we're basically grass rooting this thing. We're doing it for very, very, very little money. But the idea is if it looks good for very little money, can you imagine what it's going to look like when we've got a real budget behind it? And then even bigger than that, potentially that's what's exciting, but that's also the stressor. And uh, yeah. anyway, I, w I feel like it was a tremendous success, all things considered. Oh, you did That's a phenomenal cool. job. And and I gave you some some top class B roll to land on the digital cutting room floor. You you won't ever see it. Just skip over it. But somewhere there's there's uh <laughs> I spoke to your cameraman for a while and he just couldn't 
he couldn't get a straight answer out of me. It was a lot of fun. Well, I'll tell you what, but I did when I came, out out of, sponsors. I came out of the transfer room today and I had found the timer cam shot of your attempts and I stepped across the hall and he happened to be sitting there. He, we were just finished in the studio doing the Bianchi cup rap and he was doing things related to that. And I said, uh, the timer cam looks awesome. And he goes, yeah. And I go, do you happen to catch this dude? I know you did because I see where he walks over and starts talking to you. And he goes, yeah, that guy's awesome. And I was like, yeah, that's potato for hire. I'm going on his podcast later. <laughs> Not like, my podcast. No, no, no. I'm a guest here. Jeff just died inside. He just turned red and died inside. Nope, He's like, no, this nope. is my podcast. He made this. He built this in Oklahoma. I'm sorry. I'm going on a podcast that he's a guest on with his friend, Jeff. <laughs> my friend, Jeff, now. Uh, that's right. I've just that's been right. promoted to friends, Jeff. Well, Jeff wasn't yeah. even sure he wanted me here. I'm kind of a Jeremy creation. <laughs> well, you know. So I think it's important to have somebody that has the level of understanding and minutia related to the hit factor scoring system, what's valuable, what time is valuable versus what standing reload isn't valuable and so on. Um, to your point, I got into or I was privy to listen to a conversation uh, that was happening between the Army Boys and Christian on stage 20 where there was the option to run all the way to the front shooting area. And mm. what does that equal versus time versus a C yeah. versus a better chance at an A versus a couple of extra shots for the 45 yard steal and the double stack versus the, and Christian's ability to start rattling off point two point, whatever this point for this, it'll be three seconds to run up there. All of this business for me was like, Okay, so that's the difference between mathing this out on a GM level and just kind of hanging out and deciding if you're fast and want to run up there. Well, yeah, there's a lot of people who are competing at an extraordinarily high level, not not at Siler's level, but an extraordinarily high level who don't math it out. And they intuit right. that and they look at it and they're like, this is the play for me. And they're right. But Siler has always been, all right, this target, this is how much time I'm spending on it. And a few years ago, he used to walk around with, you know, somebody else, you know, taking down the times to figure out the plan based on, I know it takes, you know, and again, in this version of reality, I'm Siler. I know it takes me 0.8 seconds to get over here. And that's a half second transition. And I'm going to split 20s on those two. And all right, that's the plan. That's the lowest yep. number. That's the plan. It just doesn't matter the difficulty. What's, yeah. you know, it's, it's a race. There's a starting and there's an end. And whoever gets to the end first wins. You got it. <laughs> yeah, for the, I don't know, for the majority of the field, the the math doesn't come into play a whole lot, I don't think. But for that top, but usually top five, ten percent of people, the math the math matters. So there. And, and, and JJ did make the run, and was a very close third place on that that stage. Um, yep. but that's something that JJ can do. And Mason, yeah. I think was ninth on that stage and he made the run and that's something Mason can do. But for 90% of the people in the match, they were better off doing 15 reload 15 from a back box mm -hmm. because their yep. bullets are going to fly faster than their feet and they're not going to get any better hits up close. That's yeah, wild. I people say that the bullets go faster than feet. I just feel like it's I've a comfort thing. I've, like whether you're fast to run all the way up there, those targets look better over the top of the gun when you're right on top of them than when you're all the way at the back and you don't know if you're connecting on that. I mean, they might be Delta Mike, Delta Mike, whack five at the steel, and I don't even know what happened, and it's still <laughs> 30 seconds. You know what I mean? So it's a I, I wish I had, had asked Shane what he did because Shane a couple of years ago told me if they let me shoot it closer, I shoot it closer. <laughs> Right. Shane, as you know, was dealing with that quad injury. With the leg, from, so. Right. Yeah. And he did not make the run, I can tell you that, um, just okay, because good. we were there. But he did make some aggressive uh, power moves in instances where I saw a limp after the fact. I heard Grimace, mm -hmm. and I even asked him, I was like, dude, how much are you going to put into the, you know, how much will you put into this physically? Because, you know, I mean, you're, you're, 
you're 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 doing more damage to your injury and he's like well leg will heal i'm like i hate to hear that because at the same time it's like yeah the leg will heal but will it and you're not 19 anymore dude you got to think smart here and really what's the genuine outcome you know if you gain a couple positions on this stage because you did a power physical move that you normally when you're healthy can do no problem but in this case you're not at the end of the day even if you gain a few places on this stage you're not even in the conversation for the overall win it's that winner's mentality but the winner's mentality in this sport if you're giving away your physical well-being and what's the real trade out even if you are going to win what do you what do you win here that's worth longer recovery on an injury like that that's my question yeah. Yeah, but when you're when you're a competitor, especially like Shane, it's so aggressive. Like he's not going to show up and lay it up, right? He, he's he's just not going to be able to to show up and shoot it half heartedly. No, so, either either don't go or or go and and hurt yourself. But yeah. there's no there's no middle ground. And, and since he was there, we know what his choice was. Oh yeah, he, yeah. He, that was he shot a phenomenal match. He was very, he had very just consistent had 10 on stitches an taken out of his incredibly technically demanding set of stages. I want to speak to that. Um, easily the most visual and, to your point, technically and even physically demanding courses of fire that I've seen in a Nationals in some number of years. Um, beautifully laid out based on the bays that they had to work with, you know, the whole – Zone one and zone two mm -hmm. A were in hard sided bays. So if there were going to be any lateral shots, they had to go into bullet traps. Um, zone two B and zone three actually had brand new dirt berms where they could shoot laterally and it worked out quite nicely. Uh, but with regard to the limitations of the range itself, they made some very impressive courses of art. So I saw some some negativity as far as like zone one or the first day. Some people were talking about the stages they saw with the the walls built with the beams. Um, but after that, I didn't I didn't really see anything for the next two days. So what uh, you guys having been there? I've, obviously, John, you you seem to think that the stages were pretty pretty great. I've heard from other people that they were also pretty great. Potato, what's your take on the stages? <laughs> oh, well, I don't think the stages were pretty great. I think the level of difficulty <laughs> was appropriate. Um, I think yeah. lots of hard partialing. And I think in any division that gives people the ease of shooting that a, a red dot provides, where you know what's happening in real time, as long as you choose to pay attention to it, which w mm -hmm. was an ongoing issue for about three days for me, um, pulling the trigger and already shifting my attention to the next task before observing what had just yeah. happened. Um, so zone one, I think, sort of hit the super squads, both of them, uh, like a Mack truck, and they started there in the rain. So it was very mm -hmm. sort of positionally specific, very challenging shooting with lots of risk. Um, and it was really hard and really choppy. I don't think that's a problem. I think that's a good thing for a dot division. The level of difficulty was appropriate. The stages, however, often tested the same elements again and again and again. Mm. And without going into the matchbook in too much detail, you'd have stages like seven and nine separated by chronograph that were essentially the same stage with the same factor, with the same mm. mover swinger challenges, um, the same partial entry and exit targets, the same sort of low paper to far steel transitions. And so people got confused, not, I mean, good people, not, not the me's of the world. I mean, the super squads of the world got confused after they shot the stages, which stage they were even talking about. Hmm. So these were people who burned in a good plan and they couldn't tell seven from nine apart five minutes after they shot it. And that to me is like an element of sameness. Um, yeah. and then there were some filler stages. There always are. That's part of USPSA's tradition is they decide on the round count. And then they made sure there's stages that reach that round count. Um, and so there were, there were some genuinely nothing stages and the constraints of the bays shaped how stages hit the ground. But I don't think it's the difficulty and the sheer number of penalties. That's not my problem. I think that's great. 
there were so many stages with these 50% IPSC targets that are half hardcover, left or right. Those are great targets for dot divisions. Um, they, honestly, they're great targets for major iron sighted divisions. Mm -hmm. I think they would be absurd in a production match. Yeah. Because well, you're at least to have a lot demanding of them people. Be. What's that? At least to have a lot of them, it would be. Well, to have three or four in a stage, including on targets that you're to be yeah. competitive, you have to be moving aggressively. In. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Obviously, I can speak to the stages that we worked on, which yeah. weren't all of them. You have a better take for all of the stages. Uh, I never set foot on stage seven. We spent quite a bit of time on stage nine. Stage nine is the one that had the big deep puddle where everybody got their feet wet, whether you wanted to or not. And yeah. that was a question for me that I le I legitimately asked around, hey, how come we can't get some more material to fill in this low spot where water is standing? And the answer was, well, we can. They just need to get a shovel. They being the ROs working stage nine. And for me, it was like, it feels like something that should be in match support. It feels like if you realize you have something like this that is an issue in a shooting area, match support should be able to bring a solution to that in the form of whatever it takes, shovels, rakes, more material. I mean, there's a Mr. Fix-It who brings you new target stands. How come we can't focus the effort from him on fixing that instance so that everyone who shoots that course of fire in day one schedule and day two schedule doesn't have to shoot the rest of their day with sopping wet shoes and socks. That's just for me, that's just kind of a housekeeping thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. I know that they were distributing rakes and shovels because I saw that kind of work happening on other courses of fire with other RO crews maintaining their shooting areas and why it was such an issue on that one. I don't really have a good answer for. Hmm. Um, what was your take on skills tested? Mine? Potato. Oh, yeah. Let's start with, oh, no, we'll go with John. Because he actually got to watch the good shooters. I, I got to watch one good shooter, so that's okay. Okay. Well, for me, um, we primarily focused on, especially in Zone 3, we, we focused on the two courses of fire that had the big movement pieces, uh, okay. 19 and 20. And the separator there was not so much the fleet of foot because all of those guys are fast. All of those guys can run. Um, the differentiator in both of those instances was, was the accuracy on target. Everybody was within a second or two. Um, and what was interesting was the guy who literally put his foot on the gas on day three and never took like all the way down to his final stage, which he won outright. Uh, he was dominant or at least in the conversation on those last three courses of fire. And that's yeah. Christian. I mean, he was, he was literally doing it and he was in that mindset and you know, he's in that mindset because as soon as he's done shooting, he's ready with the, my mindset is to win. I am here to win and I'm going to keep my foot on the gas soundbite and he walks off and that's it. That's what you get. That's, that's how he operates. Yeah. And when he's talking like that, after he has shot, you know that he's in that mode. When he starts talking things yeah. like I'm playing catch up, I'm taking risks that I don't want to, that's costing me. That's when you know he's not on his game. So I can literally tell you when he is in that championship mindset and the championship performance, just based on how he talks to the camera after a course of fire. Nice. That's nice. cool. He came yeah. out on day three to win the match and then he won the match on day three. Yeah. yeah. 100%. Day three was his day. Yeah. Uh, but the stages allowed <laughs> for different kinds of separation on day three too. So there's an element in the, the, the schedule, the super squad shot with zone one, having a lot of very difficult shooting and he's got fun, great fundamentals, but there's a, there's an RNG element when you have high risk shooting, when you have, you know, bobbers and partial exposure swingers that are three quarters hardcover, there's an element of random number generator that the person whose hits are there may or may not be the, you know, if, if you let everybody shoot it 10 times, you might have a different winner. Um, yeah. And on day three, there was a lot fewer of those stages. 
And so I think it, it let uh, Jacob, who also had a very strong day three for the most part, really sort of express themselves on some stages. Yep. So did you feel that there was adequate skills tested at the match? Yeah, not the full diversity of skills I would have liked to see tested, honestly. But I felt difficulty. It's, it comes back to a different conversation that nobody wants to have with me. But it's very hard to make a, da uh, a match that's interesting and appropriate for all of the divisions we currently have. Because the ease of shooting open and carry optics and PCC when it comes to partial targets versus iron yeah. divisions, it is just so much easier. Um, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, di it's difficult at the level of paying attention, but it's easy at the level of information. And so I don't, I think the difficulty was right. The skills, there weren't enough activators. The activators were all sourced from the same company and had the exact same timing. If you saw mm -hmm. one bobber, you saw every bobber in the match. Um, I thought bobbers were used well to keep people in positions, but not as an actual challenge. So you were stuck because of the timing of the bobber, but you weren't worried about the hits. Even on the tuxedo bobbers and the hardcover bobbers, they yeah. they sort of stood up for so long. And I mean, again, whoever made them, they ran flawlessly. We didn't have reshoots, but that's good. What but about it's nice uh, when you have a variety of of activated targets? And really, there was two here. There was a bobber, and there was a swinger. Oh, okay. Hmm. What about, uh, and this will be my last question on this and then we'll get into talking about results, but what about, um, positional stuff? So like lean, like hard leans, uh, squat having to go low ports prone. There was not, there was not a single low port in a match. There no was not port. a medium port in a match. Um, the ports there were, were slit ports which are height agnostic. And so like at the level of competitive equity, a slit port challenges positional specificity in a way that's appropriate for people, whether they're six foot eight or four foot yeah. 10. So there is, there is an argument for slit ports. There were no low ports. There was no prone shooting. Uh, the only, the only uh, weak handed shooting was a classifier from 2003. Um, what about, did you, was there some hard leans, hard lean shooting? There were, but the hard leans were set up to allow um, hard exits. So you could fall out of the position if it wasn't at the end of the stage or as the last target in the stage. Um, cool. There were no places where you took a hard lean to make a hard shot. Uh, there were okay. three hard leans in the match and one of them you ended the stage and one of them you essentially drop stepped out to, to hit an activator through a port. Um, yeah. Hmm. Okay. Yep. So, and, and again, I think positional challenges like leans are particularly hard in optic divisions and it are a good skills challenge to make difficult shots or to shoot activated targets on a lean is an interesting challenge that allows for the people higher up to really separate. Yeah. Mm. Yep. I found it interesting right. that there were a couple of gun on table start stages. Typically there aren't as many there's usually maybe one uh but there was one particular gun on table and you're forced to sit in a chair and then on the uh on that stage 19 with the big run option it's gun on table again shoot the middle section and then retreat so that usually there's one for a match there were there were two maybe more i don't know there were two on at least two of the stages that we filmed on for sure just those two. Um, one was a yeah. unloaded start on stage one, and one was the, the loaded pickup you're talking about. People call it the Dorito stage because it's three triangle shooting areas. Yeah. So I like stage that. Stage twenty, the Dorito stage. Um, so stage one, where you know Super Squad A started, um, right? Just for fun, anyone listening to this who hasn't, and I'm sure they all have, just go look at the scores. If you know who's on Super Squad A, I'm not gonna name and shame a bunch of people who beat me. But I don't know if it was the driving rain or if it was nerves or if it was the fact that nobody figured out it was a five-factor stage. But I saw some absolutely world-class world champion shooters put up runs that were 10 Alpha, 10 Charlie. Mm. <laughs> All yeah. right. John Leaguer made a statement on that stage. He came right off the bat and was like, I'm here to win with this mustache. <laughs> yes. Yep. Uh, yeah. I think Jay Beal was up first on the squad and Vlieger was probably last. And Vlieger mm -hmm. said, I've just heard the 
the Alpha Charlie count and Delta count from my fellow competitors, I'm going to go to all of the spots and shoot alphas and not really <laughs> right. worry about blending and fading out and covering a lot of ground. I'm going to do it in whatever, 18 seconds and shoot 17 alphas, three Charlies. But it was a five factor stage they started on. And I think people, people hit it like it was a seven or an eight factor stage with the kind of like looseness that was gotcha. punished. Dude. So it was a lot easier for us shooting that on day two. We're like, yeah, this, this one, aim. Doesn't really matter how long it takes. Aim. 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 Better than a lot of people. Nice, nice. All right, well, before we move into uh, talk about our predictions a little bit, uh, we're going to give our shout outs and talk about today's show sponsor, which is Shooters Connection. So, Shooters Connection has been sponsoring the show for a while now. We do appreciate their support. If you guys need anything shooting related, uh, if you need gear equipment, they even have, they've got guns. Um, they've got your, your pasters, paster guns, targets. They got all that stuff. Anything you need for the range, man. Uh, they'll keep you stocked. They're doing same day shipping, shipping out super fast. You're going to get that stuff when you need it. So support shooters connection, use the link in the description, uh, let them know that the, they're, uh, they're, they're being heard here on the podcast. And also, uh, today's shout outs from the Patreon group in the Discord. We just have one from Sean Hedlund shooting. Shout out to all the Hit Factor podcast members on some great and some mediocre performances at CO Nats. Oh. Hmm. Oh. Right on. What did you, and Potato put some. Uh, I put a screenshot in the. <laughs> Yeah, the Discord from Wanzik because they were they were shouting out their uh, PSTG members and how they finished at nationals. So I I put a, put a call in the Discord asking for uh, metrics for Hit Factor Discord members and their finishes at nationals. They they weren't quite as impressive as a PSTG group. All right, <laughs> we had what was it, Potato? We had. So it depends. It depends how you count Discord members, and I'm so I'm going to give you credit for Scott Brown, even though he only joined to to win the reloading challenge last year and has never been hey, seen since. We'll but take he's him. a member now. Yeah, um, we'll and Matt Hopkins is a member and lurks under an anonymous name, and he he had his strongest nationals. I don't care how he feels about it. He had his strongest CO nationals in years. Uh, he was very consistent at a nice. very challenging match. So way to go, way to go, Hoppy Cakes. Um, obviously, Jay Beal uh, did Jay Beal things, um, and so he's the, the he's right there. And he's I, I he's the highest performer, right? From from the Discord, that's correct. We don't. Yeah, and a super so. nice guy, by the way. Yeah, he is. Oh no, he's a big jerk. <laughs> no, dude, super nice guy. <laughs> Sorry, I was staying with him for the match. I traveled with him. Uh, he'll listen to this later. He'll, he won't be offended. <laughs> yeah, so PSTG, they had, Wanzi said they had, in the top 10, they had four members. In the top 30, they had nine members. And our numbers were, we had two in the top 30 <laughs> and three in the top 55. And that's that's uh, Magnus Krohn, came in 55th. He had He had a good match. Um, oh, all right. He didn't quite hit. He didn't quite beat the the person he really wanted to beat, but he yeah. beat some of the people he wanted to beat. So, and I, I guess this is assuming that Potato knows everybody. So, I think I do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably forgetting someone. I I apologize. <laughs> um, there's all right. Others. Enough of that. All right. Let's talk about these predictions and who was right and who was wrong. We'll talk about John was right. Let's start with John being right. I was going to talk about who is the most wrong first. Who is the most wrong? Who's the well, wrongest of them all? Actually, it might have been. Hold on, hold on. You got to make sure it's I... Jeremy before you start talking about who is the most wrong because it could have been you. Yeah, that's why well, I was like, I was the Aaron Eddy pick. That was not even in the ballpark. <sighs> uh, as he's posted, I think, on social media after day one, is. Um, He's going nice to recoil a lot, and Charlie's hurt. <laughs> yeah, that that was my question to him. Was like, "Hey, bro, this is minor, and you can't have that many Charlies." And he was like, "I know. I don't know what I'm doing here." Okay, so Jeremy got one right, 
and I think I got none. <laughs> <laughs> all right. oh. I was the most wrong. I think we all should get credit for not picking JJ Top Five. We do. We do. And I think I should get a half a point for saying JJ's downfall is going to be his equipment again. That well, and I think I should get all of the points for slipping that uh, round in there with no powder. I didn't. (laughs) That too. That too. But I did get a message from my friend Aki in Finland about apparently the rumor was the gun blew up, which it did not. Squib. It was just a squib. It just cost him the stage. And and people can be in appropriately like high and mighty about how many squibs they haven't had. But as someone who has had a number, they happen. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So I had picked uh, Jacob and then Christian and then Nils and then Max and then Aaron. So you got two out of five. But I got none of the placements correct. Yeah, but you got two out of five. It's just just inside your window of five, you got two out of five correct, which is actually – it's self instructive. I mean, that's how that's, the that's field one is. way to look at it. That that's like if you want to give some credit, that's fine. Uh, Jeremy actually did get picked Nils for second, and Nils got second. But True. he had Jacob, Nils, Christian, Max, Mason. So Jeremy got one. Hmm. All right. So who who is next in their their correctness? <laughs> I think we're equally wrong. Yeah, I think I we both just got the first one right and then uh, didn't have any other placements correct after that. Yeah, so y'all both picked Christian first, and then Potato had Jacob second, mm. and then Jay third, Nils fourth, Mason fifth. Sean, Christian first, Max second. Which, yep. dude, Max was, he was in it. Until, Until the last day, right? Yeah, yeah, he was he was right there in it. There was uh there was two packs on the last at the beginning of the last day. There was Nils and Christian um nominally on the same high available. Nominally on the, but if you look at their trajectories, this is Christian mm-hmm. on the upswing through day two and, and Nils sort of doing Nils things and staying where he is. Yeah. And um then Jacob and Max uh back a little bit, but not mm-hmm. gone. Have yeah, so you looked three, at sorry. what happened to what happened to Max on I day three Max. on seventeen, and what would have happened had that not been the case? Um, I do. I'm also aware of that. Now. From I was, a I was from a Max really standpoint, talk about because, it because like the guy's pretty public and he, yeah, yeah. Well, but from a Max standpoint, had that not been the case, in terms of his placement and finish, it would have been a dramatic change, dramatic change, like could have possibly unseated the winner. Anyway. So what what happened? That's not where the math stood from where I was sitting, but. Well, um, it was a. Okay. My perspective on, on what happened on 17 is, and this is all sort of psychobabble, so disregard as as you will is um on some right. level you're right to disregard me or you're right that the, no no you're right you're right that it doesn't map out uh like he could have a big stage he could have a big stage win there and, and christian finish was, third christian was a big stage win there and score compression he finishes third huge That's stage right. win there um, well, it with a been normal a- stage win there he still finishes fourth same as you take away jj's zero to 11th and now who knows what alternate universe he finishes let's say he shoots a 75 percent on 11 instead of zeroing it he finishes right. third let's say he wins right. it but barely he finishes third um so huge credit to jj for finishing where he did while zeroing 120 point stage he gave us all yeah. 120 point gift and 484 of us couldn't take advantage of it um it sucks <laughs> to be us but but so this is my made up psycho babble. And if Max Michelle ever meets me and wants to slap me, he's welcome to, mm-hmm. I think on some level when you're that good and you're shooting that well. And he was on day three, he had a couple of stage wins day three. He was shooting. Well, he absolutely demolished a 
a very Max Michelle eight reload eight stage that's doubled up in that bay. The squad was split, so you know they're shooting them out of order. You'll have it all in camera. I think on some level, when you know you can't win, you would rather have a you would rather flame out and think about that than think I did my best and I came third. Interesting. Like psychologically, on some level, when you're sort of that sort of champion, it's easier to take your gun breaking or zeroing a stage or essentially zeroing that 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 uh, standard stage than it is to do your best and come forth. So you think it was like a subconscious self sabotage, basically? Absolutely. Again, not knowing him, just from just from the outside, and then a couple of other things. But yes, interesting. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Yeah. I can only speak to what he and I spoke about after it happened because I didn't see it happen. What happened? His, his take on it was that a paster fell off of one of the targets, which caused him to have an extra hit and receive the extra hit penalty. Hmm. So, But that's just the 10 points. There's three mics after the reload. So it's 22 yards in people's in. Instagram, it's a 30-yard standard stage. It's 22 yards. I've got pretty good pacing. Um, I, uh, so it's 22-yard target, eight reload eight. After the reload, he misses the re the first target he shoots three times. And then they also hit him with a procedural and said he dived one of the misses low enough to hit the bottom target. But that's 10-point procedural. It's Virginia count for extra hit on paper. Um, mm -hmm. The three mics are already down 45 on the stage. So yeah, it's down yeah. 55 points, but you're down 45 either way. So it would move it from a 13% stage to a 20% stage. Interesting. As someone who has two mics on that stage, just like oh, the winner, who also had two mics on that stage. Uh, it's so, a popular stage to collect mics. Christian shot two mics on that too, or didn't shoot them as it were. Huh. But yeah, Christian came, uh, came in really strong on the last day. Like... Like Potato and I were talking about it. We we were talking about it earlier today. And like for a standard match, like historically, the way Nils shot, he should have won that match. Uh he didn't he didn't win any stages. He didn't tank any stages. He shot super consistent right at the top the whole match. Like any other match, pretty much, that wins. That performance wins. But day three, Christian came out, and he took it from him. On day three, Christian took the match, and he came out, and he won it. So yeah. that's what was pretty interesting to watch unfold, is that Nils was doing what he always does. He was winning. That performance usually wins. But Christian came out and just kicked ass. Just to put it in yep. math terms, because it's fun for me, is – I shot 2% worse than I did last year, and I basically shot the same match. Do you know who else shot 2% worse than they did last year? Nils. <laughs> he finished on 98% instead of winning, right? So right. me and Nils, we shot the same match a year apart uh, that we did last year. And last year he was the winner, and this year he wasn't. Christian absolutely won the match. Um, that's not an accident. He did. He went and, and thought about yeah. what would the winning run be on this stage. And then he did that. And on the yeah. stages where it wasn't the winning run, it was a 95 or a 98%. Well, mm -hmm. when it comes to sewing it up at the end, um, obviously Christian and Nils were shooting separately from each other, but Christian went on to stage 21, which it was the final stage for Nils's match. Christian had already shot it and he literally skull dragged the whole freaking field. Like Nils ended up 11th. And that was a 16 point swing in, in Christian's favor. So it's that type of a performance that, uh, that wins championships. And man, I mean, I'm telling you that guy, that guy is, that guy is all that he is. He's exactly what he said he would be. And he is that. Yeah. And yeah, it ended up 42 winner. point spread. Um, when we did our prop mm -hmm. bets, uh, last okay. week, yeah, I, I told Jeremy, I think it's going to be only three people over 2,000 match points, and I think there'll be 35 points at the top. And Jeremy said, really? It'll be close. I said, no. I, yeah, think, yeah. I think the person I think is going to win walks away with it at the end. And uh, there was three people over 2,000 match points. Um, 
Yeah, and, you pretty uh, much nailed 42 that one. point spread. I actually got so, that one right. I got a bunch of other wrong. We won't listen to that other episode. So that one I got is right. there a prop bet? Like, is there a prop bet section of the Discord that I haven't found yet? And how do we add a like a PayPal or a Venmo <laughs> button? So we can like really get some juice going in this thing. Hey, really get I love that Discord terms of service from. is they would nuke it. <laughs> yeah. Is that right? Well, yeah. we'll maybe we use, need uh, to get the rumble party. or something. I don't we know. Need a thir- we need a third party. Um, yeah. We need to get it you, on you stage. Really, you really want to bring some disrepute to the sport. Start making yeah. it worth people's money to lose. Right. Uh, yeah. Well, that's it's not worth their money to win, right? Like, this, <laughs> But... Uh, <laughs> Should, I guess that's why the value games. of the build drill challenge becoming so lucrative potentially makes sense because then you can actually gamble on it as a third party and you know a guy's yeah. not trying to throw it. If he's there to win a hundred grand, he's not gonna throw that away. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Good Did times. You, John, you said that you had people asking you yes. if there was a, a bookie this, or whatever. That 100% explains why I was getting those messages. They were coming into the Shooting USA Instagram from accounts that, that like, they were unknown accounts, but it was, like, a number of different messages that said, what what sports book is taking this action? How do I bet on this? And I guarantee you it's because they were listening to y'all because it was that Friday that those messages started coming. It's hilarious. Oh, that's amazing. That is yeah. That's the future of this, man. We got to make it so lucrative that people won't take a dive. And then we got to get money behind it on a gambling front. And that yeah. will take this thing to a level where we can make money for the guys who are the best in the world. And we can make money for guys like us who understand it, can talk about it, mm-hmm. and can handicap it. Yeah. And, and uh, speaking of people who are going to doing some winning, it's, it's early days yet, but we got we to gotta start thinking about uh, Iron Sight Nationals, because I think there's a four way race in single stack. What uh-huh. do you think, Jeff? A four way four way race. Obviously, me, you, McLean, Flieger, and Reed. Mm. And then I think Latham and Heron yeah. round out the top six. I have never beat Robbie. So we'll Yet. see. Yeah. Always say he's always, he's yet, always, like, he's always like, just right there, right there. Because in uh, did anybody mention Elias? Is Elias Frangulis in this conversation? Yeah, I think he is. He should be. He is. He should be. He'd be. Yeah. He'd be okay. up there too. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Yeah, because in 2019, Robbie was like, I think he was 12th, and I was 13th. And then in 2020, I was he third. was first, and you he were was third. first. Yeah, and then in limited 10, which I did the next day. I was third, and he was second. He was second. <laughs> yeah, so I've never beat him. He's always just, like, right there. So, yeah, I can we'll say one more goes. thing about the match is uh, I was shooting with a uh, couple friends of mine, um, and one of whom uh, had a great match, and one of whom had the kind of match most people who went to that match said they had. Um, and the one who had the great match is one letter behind me in the alphabet, so... There are two letters behind, but anyway, shoots after me all day. So we shot the same plans and it was magical to go out there and have things not go well and then have somebody else do what you wanted to do, <laughs> but nail the execution. You're like, yeah. yes, this is what I wanted to do. That was, you know, the timing was absolutely there. You just had to do the thing. Uh, right. Completely possible. That was a great plan, right? It wasn't the plan. It was me. It's a wonderful feeling. He got some you know, we like validation. To, PSA, yeah, we, we like to think, oh, you know, I, I shot the bad plan. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. So that's nice. So uh, Elias Frangoulis, you, Jeremy mm. Reed. And John, yeah, because he took John, third a year or two ago. Johns. Yeah, both the Johns, yeah. It should be fun. It would be a good one. Or I'm trying to see if uh, – I mean, we shouldn't be able to, but I might bug some people and see if Jeremy and I can get put on the super squad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but if not, it doesn't really matter. We'll just do our thing. So, 
I well, don't know. There's uh, there's somebody in the top ten at the Carry Optics Nationals shooting off the squad, as he yeah. prefers. Oh, it, it happens, right? So, because Mason won limited shooting off the squad a couple years ago. So, it's, don't it's possible. Don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, y'all got anything else on uh, Bill Drill Challenge or Nationals or anything else? Well, <clears throat> the conversation has begun about whether or not we remove the upper scoring zone going forward. And mm. what does yeah. it look like at this point now that both the ringer from 22 and now the ringer from the first event of 23 won because of the yeah. upper scoring zone, or as Potato called it, I like that. The What was that? The, 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 miss the alpha catcher. catcher? The miss catcher. Yeah. It's pretty yeah. rad. I think um, the only logical move is to make one in that zone required. <laughs> Whoa. So that's Five season two. Five in the two. lower, one in the upper. That's season two, and maybe it's two targets, and it's a Mozambique on one, yeah. reload Mozambique on two. But, you, you know, that's, that's pretty advanced. Um, yeah. The conversation, though, has actually been tabled already about what does it look like to create a proprietary target for that drill mm -hmm. and others going forward. Um, that might be a possibility. We'll see. Yeah. Hmm. What would that target look like? Well, it would definitely be 18 inches wide so that it works with a traditional target stand. The scoring zone would be... And this was some input that I got from Billy because, you know, truth be told, we went into Cabela's there in Columbia and because my one of my cameramen, my boy, showed up in some white Chuck Taylors to a match with four <laughs> inches of standing water on the range. And I was like, bro, I got to get you some. You're my kid. I'm going to get you some boots. So we went in Cabela's. And I got him some boots. But we walked through the gun, uh, the gun counters at Cabela's, which were very impressive. They were very well stocked and was happy to report that they had the entire catalog of Colt snake guns under glass and for sale, which is unusual in most gun stores. So mm -hmm. anyway, walking out of there, we walked through a whole aisle of targets. And one of the targets that I stopped and looked at for a moment that gave me this idea is the fact that they had for sale Three Gun Nation targets still on the shelf in Cabela's. Three Gun Nation's been off the air for almost 10 years, but their targets are still there and available for sale. So it wouldn't necessarily be as simple as a Three Gun Nation target, but it could. 18 inches wide, perhaps 18 inches tall. And on the input that I got from Billy, the scoring zone needs to open not only vertically, but horizontally congruently so as it grows tall it should also grow wide if it were going to um okay so that's kind of a that's kind of the model that we would start with uh the guys at hdtarget.com obviously bent over backwards to be involved this time want to do anything think it's a great idea send me a diagram i'll make you some prototypes like they're on board so Maybe it's something that we could start tabling in the Discord. What's a reasonable target for a seven-yard bill drill that could also be utilized for other drills um, that yeah. isn't too generous, but maybe is generous because that will allow people to push it a little harder. Um, there was some conversation going into the final. Somebody somehow had gotten the impression that we were going to do it at five yards for the final instead of seven. And uh, there's no way like I was just I was like, no, we can't do that. Um, Isaac had that impression for some reason. And I was like, no, nah, we can't do that. It has to be seven, dude. It's good. What what does that do to the credibility of what we're trying to do here? If all of a sudden you two guys get to shoot it at five and everybody else who shot it had to do it at seven. It makes no sense. So yeah. what was interesting was was Billy was under that impression, too. Both guys were super mellow about it. Like when we went out there to do the thing, Billy was like, oh, we're doing it at seven. And I was like, yeah. So I don't know where he got the idea, where Isaac got the idea. But anyway, maybe uh, maybe a topic of conversation for the Discord. People can throw in their two cents. Um, it would have to be a design that doesn't already exist because many are trademark slash copyrighted, obviously. Um, gotcha. But if we're partnering with a with a company like HD Targets, they'll do the due diligence to make sure we're not stepping on somebody else's IP. So, um, yeah, yeah. 
Okay, well, we'll see uh, We'll see where this challenge ends up. Hopefully, we'll see it at more matches and watch this thing grow, man. Well, I'll tell you this. As soon as I can confirm it, I will let you know so that we can tell the masses because you reach people. Your platform that you all have developed actually reaches people, and it's pretty cool to have been invited to be a part of it now twice and have people react to me being a part of it. And I'm thankful for you guys allowing me to be in here. So thanks again. Yeah. You've come a well, long way, Jeff, from another sports shooting podcast. Yeah. The ass cast. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's an unfortunate Not necessarily accident. a powerful name. I'm suggesting no. maybe we get you some art for the wall behind you. We got to do something behind you. Yeah. Yeah. For we'll, all, the, we'll all, the, all the viewers. Yeah. Is that starry night? That's pretty cool. I don't know. It's that's a picture my sister gave me. Um, we didn't shout out the um, other thing from the prop bet, which is uh, women's winner was Justine Williams um, again. Um, Morgan in second, who was two years ago the winner, and then third, a newcomer to the podium, Alicia Russell, shoots all the matches up here in the Northeast. Phenomenal shooter, lovely human being, travels around with her husband Joe. So way to go, Alicia, coming in third in a, a pretty big field of forty odd women. Um, contesting that so yeah, awesome that's awesome uh, i know i know you've had you've had some dissension about even even going there jeff so i was hoping to get under your skin a little bit but. what no no i'm usually the one that is defending giving a shout out to the ladies titles and unlike last year this year the ladies winner didn't beat me <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Neither did the right. senior. And oh, the senior did. The senior did. The super senior didn't, though. Oh, you got the super senior. No, I was marked safe from super seniors. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we also didn't call out the other in the top five: John Flieger in fourth, Garen Singleton in in fifth. Garen Singleton shot a phenomenal match. I hope you got some good uh, footage of him. On, on Super Squad B there, John. Yeah. Dude, I mean, Garen is a surprise standout on a couple of stages, including uh, that Dorito stage we were talking about. That dude, Oh, yeah, he's right up there with the winner on Dorito. I think he was fourth on that stage. Yeah, bro. Uh, didn't see that one coming. Uh, you look at that guy in the lineup and go, he doesn't have the wheels. He made up – well, first of all, he does have the wheels. And yeah. second of all, that dude made hits, 22 alphas, eight charlies on that stage. He was he was definitely making it happen. I was thoroughly impressed. And always a super nice guy and a freaking crusher of a grip. Like, you shake hands with that dude, be ready. It's like Bob Vogel 2.0. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he, he'll be delighted to hear that. Yeah, dude. I think he knows. Yeah, so Garen, he, like, the first time I remember seeing him on the scene was probably three or four years ago at Production Nationals. And he was, like, he made the super fourth, squad there, yeah. He was, like, fourth place or something, I think. Uh, and then we didn't – I think he didn't place well for the last couple of years, and, and now he is Well, he was ninth at five. CO Nationals and then in 2021, and then last year he yeah. had a rougher year, and then um, uh, this year did not. Yeah. So – it's good to see him back in the top five. That's good. What else, Potato? What else are we missing? Well, uh, 90% didn't go as deep as we thought it would. It, uh, it only no. went to 18 places. Uh, yeah. 75th was on 80%. So despite more shooters than last year, the, per the average finish went down. For most people, most people dropped yeah. a couple percent. I think somebody ruined the curve on the top end. Um, yeah, someone blew out the curve, man. Not cool. Andrew Hyder, I think the first time he's ever registered in a match, carry optics did pretty well. Mm -hmm. uh, Brand new gun. Yep. Brand new gun. <laughs> take, take it to the match. All right, shooting nationals. Uh, like literally got the gun on Friday. That's uh, nuts. And I, yeah, and I'm going to circle back to JJ finishing where he did uh, without getting to shoot one of the stages. And maybe that yeah. frees you up a little bit. And, and, and uh, your guys, boy, Scott Brown in 14th on 91.4%. Yeah, that's a really solid finish for. Notable for Scott. Scott Brown never turned up at the Build Drill Challenge. 
What? Neither did I, Nils. I, I don't. I don't. I, I don't know him or his brother or their dad, other than they're lovely human beings and their dog bear is super cool. But my bet is his decision was to not get distracted. Yeah, I understand. And and because oh. um, you you could go out there and put down a whatever a one twenty four and not quite catch Billy, and then where's your head at? And you know, um, right. Fair enough. That's that's why no, that's um, why I like it as a stop. It should be paired up with Chrono. Chrono, you're gonna go sit on the the build roll challenge stage and and try and resist the temptation to take and a do it or don't. I agree. Um, one other thing I want to point out about JJ: his equipment problems were not limited to his one squid that cost him the stage. He had dot issues on a couple of stages. Dot turned off. Mm -hmm. Dot turned back on. Dot flickered in the middle of a course of fire. We were filming one of them, so. Back to my prediction that his equipment would bite him. It did. You got hey, my equipment bit me too. Man, dots are, they don't like the rain. No, nope. it's hard on stuff. Mm -hmm. Yep. Man, that's right. Hard on camera gear too, but we were fortunate this time. Um, hey, someone else who was also in it for like the first day or two would have been Lane, Lane Grease. Yeah. Yeah, he, so was, I, he I, shot I, that first stage really strong. He was right there in the mix for quite a while, honestly. And then uh, Jay, Jay Beal was uh, at the end of day one, which really sort of played to his strengths, which was incredibly difficult shooting. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, so there's a... Uh, Brantley, Brantley Merriam came in 11th, um, but I believe mm -hmm. he has second or third most stage wins. Uh, I want to say Siler has four, maybe he has five. Um, and then it's Max and Brantley right after him. Oh, um, yeah, total... unique, unique stage that? winners. Unique there were stage 10 wins. unique stage winners oh. between you and me. So we're both right. Jeremy's wrong. Um, <laughs> key point. Uh, you, you said there would be 11. I said there'd be nine. There were 10 unique stage winners, two people not on the super squad. Um, and the lowest placement for someone who won a stage was 40th. 40th. And what did we say it was going to be? 35th for me. No, 45th was the lowest stage winner. I'm sorry, 45th was the lowest. Which was? Tom Castro um, shooting yeah. a, a really close burner uh, very, um, very fast. I thought, you know, oh, I tried to shoot it with alphas, and I thought it was yeah. fast enough, and I was like 87% on it. He was fast. And the one prop bet that I nailed the one, actually, it was the one prediction that I nailed out of everything, was the standard stage hit factor. Yes, you said eight point eight. It was eight point seven five. J. Bill just burned it down, while missing a, a draw or a reload. Yeah, yeah. Now his missed draws look like normal draws, but they were missed. Right. Yeah. It's, he's got some hand speed, dude. It does. Man, I'm it? excited for your guys' uh, iron sights there. I don't, I don't, I still don't think the bays are right, and hopefully people think a little bit harder about stages and bays. But uh, yeah, you guys should have a good time. I well, am I will looking say for this. They're continuing to improve. They're continuing to move dirt. The machines were still on site. They mm -hmm. are. They're going to continue to make adjustments to that range to make it more suitable for what we need Good. for the USPSA and what they need that um, that uh, rim fire area where they put the vendors and the lunch um, is suited specifically for that kind of, you know, they do a lot of shooting there on that particular area, but it is not suited for what we need it to be. The vendors were not well served there because people just didn't come through there. You know, they walked to the parking lot because they were forced to by the, by the berms. But I believe that that will all be sorted by the time we're back there in another couple months. Nice. We'll see. We'll see. And if anybody ever needs an Airbnb recommendation, we stayed eight mile, uh, eight minutes from the range. Beautiful, like 1850s restored farmhouse with a walk-in shower which is kind of fancy. Wow. Uh, yeah. cool. Totally like on sitting on five acres of property, 
completely reasonable rates and uh, you just take back roads and you're right on the range. So hit me up. Awesome. I'm, I'm going to book that for nationals before this comes out. So don't even try. <laughs> uh, <laughs> good luck. I'm sure, I'm sure somebody else has found it. It's not a secret. <laughs> Awesome. Actually, I'm going to call Jeremy and have him book it for nationals. So. <laughs> After he picks you up on the drive. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, all right. Let's let's uh, let's pinch it off after that. So thank you, gentlemen, for coming back on. That was a great one. Uh, thank you, everybody that listened and, and stopped in with John at nationals and let him know you heard him on the podcast. Yeah, um, man. Thanks. Then. Yeah. We appreciate everybody. So peace. We out.